Donald Keats died at Rome of a consumption and was buried in the romantic and lovely cemetery of the Protestants in that city. This is the poet Shelley speaking in the foreword to his elegy on Keats, his Adonais. It might make one in love with death to think that one should be buried in so sweet a place. This grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who, on his deathbed, in the bitterness of his heart at the malicious power of his enemies, desired these words to be engraven on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. Now, Keats, quickly. Back to the shop, Mr. John. Back to your plasters, pills, and ointment boxes, Mr. John. Shelley and others believed that Keats had been killed by the brutal reviews of his poetry in the leading magazines. What are you looking so worried about, Keats? He'll be all right. The critics had discovered that he had once been a medical student. It is a better and a wiser thing to be a starved apothecary than a starved poet. So back to the shop, Mr. John. The poor fellow seems to have been hooted from the stage of life. Hooted from the stage of life. Shelley thought so. His friend thought so. There was only one, it seemed, who didn't. That was John Keats himself. This is a mere matter of the moment. I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. And, of course, he was. But not at his death. Not for years after his death. What the world remembered throughout the 19th century, or most of it, was the pathetic figure Shelley, in his anger, had imagined like a pale flower by some sad maiden cherished, the broken lily lies. The broken lily, the pitiful gifted boy who lived but never had his life, loved but never took his love. Keats, had he known this estimate, would have grinned. He had a gift for grinning. When I was a boy, I thought a fair woman a pure goddess. I thought them ethereal above men. I find them now Perhaps equal. I could say a good deal about this, but I will leave it. For after all, I do think better of womankind than to suppose they care whether Mr. John Keats, five feet high, likes them or not. As a matter of precise fact, Mr. John Keats, at the age of 20, was five feet one and a fraction, stocky and quick, with reddish-brown hair and something about him which made men and women Forget what height he actually was. There was something else about Keats at age 20. More had happened to him for good or bad, usually bad, than most men look for in a lifetime. His father had died when he was eight, killed by a fall from a horse in the early hours of an April Sunday morning. Two months later, his mother, whom he passionately and possessively loved, had married a young bank clerk, and then, a year later, gone off with another man, leaving her four children to their grandmother's care. She was gone for five years. Five years during which Keats had started school, neglected his books, played football, fought, played football, fought. and distinguished himself for nothing. The opinion of his schoolmates was that he would end up as a general in the army. <laughs> a 
until she returned, when everything changed. Keats, according to an early biographer, resolved to carry off all the first prizes in literature, and did it by reading every book in the school library. first prize he carried off? C. H. Kaufman's Dictionary of Merchandise for the use of counting houses. But this too didn't last. Everything in Keats's life was haunted by death. Everything was brief. Everything was almost over before it had begun. His mother had come home to die of tuberculosis. When told at school of her death, Keats, who had nursed her, cooked for her, read for her, gave way to impassioned and prolonged grief. He was 14 years old. Now, Keats, quickly. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Right. Take Years afterward, Keats wrote, life must be undergone, meaning not that it must be endured, but that it must be lived. He lived it. After his mother's death, he left school, studied medicine for five years, served his intern year as dresser to the most notorious butcher among the London surgeons of his day, stood his tours of duty in the wards, slept next to the bloody operating room, handled accident cases at night, emergencies, hemorrhages, all without anesthetics or anything remotely resembling what we mean by sanitation. All this, and at the same time trying somehow to keep his family together. His young sister and his brothers I have two brothers. One, with an exquisite love of life, is in a lingering state. This was Tom, three years younger than Keats. My love for my brothers, from the early loss of our parents and even earlier misfortunes, has grown into an affection passing the love of women. And yet, with all this, because of all this, in spite of it, something else was happening to Keats in the wards and the operating theater and Tom's sick room. The genius of poetry must work out its own salvation in a man. That which is creative must create itself. <laughs> Then forth he came, his both knees faltering, both his strong hands hanging down, and all with froth his cheeks and nostrils flowing, voice and breath spent to all use, and down he sunk to death. The sea had soaked his heart through, all his veins, his toils had racked, a laboring woman's pains. Dead weary was he. Two weeks before his 21st birthday, Keats had walked out to his old school at Enfield. Here, his school friend, Charles Cowden Clark, had showed him a book, Homer's Odyssey, translated by the Elizabethan George Chapman. Chapman's rugged verse moved Keats profoundly. Its sounding fell and backed its swim with the ebbing waters till it straight arrived where Eno's fair hand it again received. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold.
realms of gold. And many goodly states. And many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been. Walking the six miles home towards his lodgings, as that night ended in the first light of dawn, Keats had hammered out a sonnet in his head, a sonnet ending with six of the most famous lines in English poetry. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told, that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene, till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortes, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise. Silent upon a peak in Darien. There was now no question of the future for John Keats. He let his appointment at Guy's Hospital lapse and burned his bolts by taking nothing with him. No document, no certificate to show that he'd ever been there. And from that time on, without knowing how he would live as a poet, uncertain even what a poet was, he committed himself to poetry. That which is creative must create itself. Six months later, in March 1817, his first volume of poems was published. It was read, as he put it, by some dozen of my friends who liked it, and by some dozen I was unacquainted with who did not. But when his next book, Endymion, appeared, there were more than a dozen readers who did not like it, and they included most of the best-known critics of England and Scotland. Back to the shop, Mr. John. <laughs> I am pursuing the same instinctive course as the veriest human animal you can think of. I am, however, young. Writing at random. Straining at particles of light in the midst of a great darkness. Back to your pillboxes, Mr. John. But however dark the darkness, however unjust the criticism, his instinctive course was sure. He seems to have been born knowing what many poets never learn, that the only subject of poetry is the living of life. The world is full of misery and heartbreak, pain, sickness and oppression. We see not the balance of good and evil. We are in a mist. We feel the burden of the mystery. The burden of the mystery. How to bear that burden? Keats put his trust in poetry. I am certain of nothing but the truth of the imagination. What the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth.
Nothing startles me beyond the moment. The rising sun will always set me to rights. Or if a sparrow come before my window, I take part in its existence and pick about the gravel. In the summer of 1818, when Keats was 22, his older brother, George, married and emigrated to Kentucky. Keats's many-paged letters to him and his wife are filled with a growing belief in his powers for poetry and with his own exquisite love of life. My dear brother George, Brown and I walked along the border of Windermere, all beautiful with wooded shores and islands and green overhead, full of foxgloves. Gentlemen, gentlemen, a toast to Mr. Newton's health and confusion to mathematics. <laughs> there was at this immortal dinner, as Hayden called it, Wordsworth, Monkhouse, Landseer, Charles Lamb, and your humble servant. Lamb got tipsy. <laughs> faint conception I have of poems to come brings the blood into my forehead. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. I feel every confidence that if I choose, I may be a popular writer. That I will never be. But for all that, I will get a livelihood. As you are fond, my dear George, of giving me sketches of character, you may like a little one from my hand. Shall I give you Miss Fanny Braun? She's about my height, with a fine style of countenance, of the lengthened sort. She wants sentiment in every feature. She manages to make her hair look well. Her mouth is bad and good. Her nostrils are fine, though a little painful. She's not 17, but she's ignorant, monstrous in her behavior, flying out in all directions, calling people such names that I was forced lately to make use of the term minx. poetry in suffering and defeat is as nearly impossible as anything can be. And yet in the months of the brutal reviews and of Tom's death, incessant money worries, his seemingly hopeless love for Fanny Braun, Keats had begun his Hyperion. And by May of the year 1819, many of his greatest poems were finished as well. It was one of the most extraordinary years in the annals of English poetry. A poem to its poet is never a telling, it is a discovering. 
What Keats had discovered in the writing of poems like his sonnet on Shakespeare's Lear was what few poets have ever known. Once again, the fierce dispute betwixt hell torment and impassioned clay must I burn through. Once more, humbly say the bittersweet of this Shakespearean fruit. Chief poet and ye clouds of Albion, begetters of our deep eternal theme, when through the old oak forest I am gone, let me not wander in a barren dream. But when I am consumed in the fire, give me new phoenix wings to fly at my desire. The fierce dispute between humankind, impassioned clay, and hell torment, the contradiction at the heart of human life, poetry's deep eternal theme. To be capable of poetry, Keats had discovered, is to be capable of life, of the suffering as well as the delight. Keats, at 24, was indeed among the English poets, though few then guessed it but he had come almost to the end of his poet's life. He seems to have known. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, One night, returning to the house which, after Tom's death, he shared with a close friend. Come on, oh. sit down. <coughs> That's blood from my mouth. Bring me the candle. Let me see this blood. I know the color of that blood. It is arterial blood. I cannot be deceived in that color. That drop of blood is my death warrant. I must die. The licensed practitioner had practiced at last on himself. My dearest Fanny, they say I must remain confined to this room for some time. From that time on, from February 1820 until September, when he left London for Rome, where he was to die, Keats's whole attention, clouded by his worsening illness, by a growing sense of failure, by loss of family, lack of money, centered itself on Fanny Braun. The consciousness that you love me will make a pleasant prison of the house next to yours. Living next door to her, he saw her daily at first, and he wrote her. According to all appearances, I am to be separated from you as much as possible. How I shall be able to bear it, I cannot tell. I wish I had even a little hope. They talk of my going to Italy. It was here in Rome, in the old house in the center of the city in which his friend the painter Joseph Seven had taken rooms, that Keats at last found quietness and peace. A 
at last burned through in his own life the fierce dispute between hell torment and impassioned clay. Poetry had saved him. Though there was still no hope, less hope indeed than ever, Keats wrote to his friend Charles Brown in London. I am so weak that I cannot bear the sight of any handwriting of a friend I love so much as I do you. Yet I ride the little horse, and at my worst, summon up more puns in a sort of desperation in one week than in any year of my life. There is one thought enough to kill me. I have been well, healthy, alert, walking with her. Now. The knowledge of contrast, feeling for light and shade, all that information, primitive sense, necessary for a poem. A great enemy is to the recovery of the stomach. There you rogue. I've put you to the torture. The knowledge of contrast, feeling for light and shade, all that information, primitive sense, necessary for a poem. No critic in the fullest flood of health has ever put the essential of poetry as well. And no dying man has ever summoned more impossible courage than Keats summoned for this last wry smile. I can scarcely bid you goodbye even in a letter. I always made an awkward bow. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. Or like stout Cortes, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise. Silent upon a peak in Darien.